from placé to partition chapter 5 the rise of extremism and the swadeshi movement when the failure of moderate politics became quite apparent by the end of the 19th century a reaction set in from within the congress circles and this new trend is referred to as the extremist trend The moderates were criticized for being too cautious and their politics were stereotyped as the politics of mendicancy. This extremism developed in three main regions and under the leadership of three important individuals Bipin Chandra Pal in Bengal, Bal Gangadhar Tilak in Maharashtra and Lala Lajpat Rai in Punjab. In other areas extremism was less powerful if not totally absent. Many causes are cited to explain the rise of extremism. factionalism according to some historians is one of them as at the turn of the century we observe a good deal of faction fighting at almost every level of organized public life in india in bengal there was division within the brahmo samaj and bitter journalistic rivalry between the two newspaper groups the bangali edited by moderate leader surendranath banerjee and the amrita bazar patrika edited by the more radical motilal ghosh There was also faction fighting between Aurobindo Ghosh on the one hand and Bipin Chandra Pal and Brahm Bandhav Upadhyay on the other over the editorship of Bande Matram. In Maharashtra there was competition between Gokhale and Tilak for controlling the Pune Sarvajanik Sabha. The contest came to the surface when in 1895 Tilak captured the organization and the following year Gokhale started his rival organization the Deccan Sabha. In Madras three factions the Mailapur clique the Egmo clique and the suburban elites fought among each other In Punjab the Arya Samaj was divided after the death of Dayanand Saraswati between the more moderate college group and the radical revivalist group One could argue therefore that the division in Congress between the moderates and the extremists was just faction fighting that plagued organized public life everywhere in India around this time But the rise of extremism cannot be explained in terms of factionalism alone. Frustration with moderate politics was definitely the major reason behind the rise of extremist reaction. The Congress under moderate leadership was being governed by an undemocratic constitution. Although after repeated attempts by Tilak a new constitution was drafted and ratified in 1899, it was never given a proper trial. The Congress was also financially broke as the capitalists did not contribute and the patronage of a few rajas and landed magnates was never sufficient. The social reformism of the moderates inspired by western liberalism also went against popular orthodoxy. This came to the surface at the Pune Congress of 1895 when the moderates proposed to have a national social conference running at tandem with the regular sessions of the Congress. More orthodox leaders like Tilak argued that the social conference would split the Congress and the proposal was ultimately dropped. But more significantly, moderate politics had reached a dead end as most of their demands remained unfulfilled and this was certainly a major reason behind the rise of extremism. This increased the anger against colonial rule and this anger was generated by the moderates themselves through their economic critique of colonialism. The Curzonian administration magnified this nationalist angst further. Lord Curzon, 1899 to 1905, a true believer in British rightiness, had the courage to chastise an elite British regiment for its racial arrogance against native Indians. But he was also the last champion of that self-confident despotic imperialism of which Fitzjames Stephen and Lytton Strachey were the ideologues. He initiated a number of unpopular legislative and administrative measures which hurt the susceptibilities of the educated Indians. The reconstitution of the Calcutta Corporation through the Calcutta Municipal Amendment Act of 1899 reduced the number of elected representatives in it. The Indian Universities Act of 1904 placed Calcutta University under the most complete governmental control. and the Indian Official Secrets Amendment Act of 1904 further restricted press freedom then his calcutta university convocation address in which he described the highest ideal of truth as essentially a western concept 
most surely hurt the pride of the educated Indians. The last in the series was the partition of Bengal in 1905, designed to weaken the Bengali nationalists who allegedly controlled the Congress. But instead of weakening the Congress, the Curzonian measures acted as a magic potion to revitalize it, as the extremist leaders now tried to take over Congress in order to commit it to a path of more direct and belligerent confrontation with colonial rule. The goal of the extremists was Swaraj, which different leaders interpreted differently. For Tilak it meant Indian control over the administration, but not a total severance of relations with Great Britain. Bipin Pal believed that no self-government was possible under British paramountcy, so for him Swaraj was complete autonomy, absolutely free of British control. Aurobindo Ghosh in Bengal also visualized Swaraj as absolute political independence. However, for most others Swaraj still meant self-rule within the parameters of British imperial structure. The radicalization was actually visible in the method of agitation, as from the old methods of prayer and petition they moved to that of passive resistance. This meant opposition to colonial rule through violation of its unjust laws, boycott of British goods and institutions, and development of their indigenous alternatives, i.e. Swadeshi and national education. The ideological inspiration for this new politics came from the new regional literature, which provided a discursive field for defining the Indian nation in terms of its distinct cultural heritage or civilization. This was no doubt a revivalist discourse, informed by Orientalism, as it sought to invoke an imagined golden past and used symbols from a retrospectively reconstructed history to arouse nationalist passions. This was also a response to the gendered discourse of colonialism that had established a teleological connection between masculinity and political domination, stereotyping the colonized society as effeminate and therefore unfit to rule. This created a psychological compulsion for the latter to try to recover their virility in Kshatriyahud in an imagined iron past, in order to establish the legitimacy of their right to rule. Historical figures who had demonstrated valour and prowess were now projected as national heroes. Tilak started the Shivazi festival in Maharashtra in April 1896 and soon these ideas became popular in Bengal, where a craze for national hero worship began. The Marathas, Rajputs and Sikhs, stereotyped in colonial ethnography as martial races, were now placed in an iron tradition and appropriated as national heroes. Ranjit Singh, Shivazi and the heroes culled from local history like Pratapaditya and Sitaram, even Sirajur Dola, were idolized as champions of national glory or martyrs for freedom. Vivekananda made a distinct intervention in this ideological discourse by introducing the idea of an alternative manliness which combined Western concepts of masculinity with the Brahmanic tradition of spiritual celibate ascetism. A physical culture movement started with great enthusiasm with gymnasiums coming up in various parts of Bengal to reclaim physical prowess, but the emphasis remained on spiritual power and self-discipline that claimed superiority over body that was privileged in the Western idea of masculinity. The Indian political leaders also looked back to ancient indo aryan political traditions as alternatives to Anglo-Saxon political systems. The Indian tradition was described as more democratic with strong emphasis on village self-government. The concept of dharma, it was argued, restricted the arbitrary powers of the king and the republican traditions of the Yodhiyas and Lichavis indicated that the Indian people already had a strong tradition of self-rule. This was directly to counter the colonial logic and moderate argument that British rule was an act of providence to prepare Indians for self-government. Indeed, at this stage, this was the central problematic of Indian nationalism. The moderates had wanted the Indian nation to develop through a modernistic course, but modernism being a Western concept, this meant an advocacy of the continuation of colonial rule. The extremists, on the other hand, sought to oppose colonial rule and therefore had to talk in terms of a non-Western paradigm. They tried to define the Indian nation in terms of distinctly Indian cultural idioms, which led them to religious revivalism invoking a glorious past, 
sometimes even unquestioned acceptance and glorification of that past. But their Hinduism was only a political construct, not defined by any definite religious attributes. As the 19th century Englishmen claimed ancient Greece as their classical heritage, the English-educated Indians also felt proud of the achievements of the Vedic civilization. This was essentially an imaginary history with a specific historical purpose of instilling a sense of pride in the minds of a selected group of Indians involved in the process of imagining their nation. Some of the leaders, like Tilak or Aurobindo, also believed that this use of Hindu mythology and history was the best means to reach the masses and mobilize them in support of their politics. The veteran moderate politicians refused to accommodate these new trends within the Congress policies and programs, and this led to the split in the Congress in its Surat session in 1907. But before going into the bizarre story of the Surat split in the Congress, 1907, we may look into the history of the Swadeshi movement in Bengal, 1905-1911, which may be described as the best expression of extremist politics. The movement began as an agitation against the partition of Bengal in 1905, which Lord Curzon had designed as a means of destroying political opposition in this province. The Bengal Presidency as an administrative unit was increasing in size with the accretion of territories through conquest and annexation. As a result, its frontiers at one point extended to Sutlej in the northwest, Assam on the northeast and Arakan on the southeast. The Presidency was indeed of an unwieldy size and therefore the necessity to partition Bengal was being discussed since the time of the Orissa Famine of 1866. In 1874, Assam was actually separated with 3 million people, while three Bengali speaking areas, i.e., Silhet, Golpara, and Kacha, were also added to it. Safeguarding the interests of Assam, rather than weakening Bengal, seemed to have been the more important consideration behind the policy decision at this stage. Year after, Making Assam a viable administrative unit came to occupy British administrative attention. In 1892 there was a proposal to transfer the entire Chittagong division to Assam. In 1896 William Ward, the then Chief Commissioner of Assam again proposed the transfer of the districts of Dhaka and Maimensingh, so that Assam could become a Lieutenant Governor's province with a separate civil service cadre. But the scheme was not favoured at that time, only the Lushai Hills were transferred in 1897 and the rest of the scheme was shelved. When Lord Curzon arrived in India and went on a tour of Assam in March 1900, the scheme was resurrected again, as the European tea garden planters demanded a maritime outlet nearer than Calcutta to reduce their dependence on the Assam Bengal Railways. In 1901, the partition of Bengal seemed more urgently required as the census in that year revealed that Bengal population had reached 78.5 million. Curzon drew up a scheme in his Minute on Territorial Redistribution in India, 19th May 1 June 1903, which was later published as the Risley Papers on 3rd December 1903. It proposed the transfer of Chittagong Division, Dhaka and Maimensingh districts to Assam and Chota Nagpur to the central provinces. Bengal would receive in return Sambalpur and the feudatory states from central provinces and Ganjam district and the Visgapattinam agency tracks from Madras. In the subsequent months the scheme gradually expanded, although secretly, through additions to the list of transferred districts. The final scheme was embodied in Curzon's dispatch of 2 February 1905 to the Secretary of State Broderick who reluctantly accepted it without even a proper parliamentary debate. The partition of Bengal was formally announced on 19 July and implemented three months later on 16 October 1905. It meant the creation of a new province of eastern Bengal and Assam, consisting of all the districts in Chittago, Dhaka and Rajshahi divisions, as well as Hiltipara, Malda and Assam. The new province would contain a population of 31 million, of which 18 million would be Muslims and 12 million Hindus, while the remaining province of Bengal would be having a population of 54 million, 42 million Hindus and 9 million Muslims. 
The Bengali Hindus would be outnumbered by the Muslims in the new province and they would be a linguistic minority in the old which would contain large numbers of Hindi and Odia speaking population. It was these demographic peculiarities of the two provinces which raised new questions was the partition really for administrative efficiency? The Kazonian administration obviously defended the scheme on administrative grounds it would reduce the excessive administrative burden of the bengal government this would also solve the problem of assam which would become a lieutenant governor's province with a separate civil service cadre there would be substantial commercial benefits as the interests of the tea gardens all and coal industries would be safeguarded the assam planters would be having a cheaper maritime outlet through the port of chittagong and the assam bengal railways which was so vital to the economic development of northeastern india would be brought under a single administration but as sumit sarkar points out all these arguments seem to have been fallacious indeed administrative considerations were uppermost in the colonial mind only until 1903 and not after that had the partition been purely on administrative grounds then the government would have accepted the alternative proposals offered by a number of civil servants suggesting more logical partition plans based on linguistic division rather than religious division of the population but cousin rejected all these proposals on political ground that linguistic unity would further consolidate the position of the bengali politicians so we should look for the real reasons of partition in the political prejudices of the colonial government indeed It was the anti-Bengali feelings of the colonial bureaucracy which Curzon was initiated into even before he became the viceroy and a desire to weaken this politically articulate community which seemed to have provided the prime motive behind the partition. Home Secretary Herbert Risley made this point clear in his note of 7th February 1904. Bengal United is a power, he argued. Bengal divided will pull in several different ways. That is perfectly true and is one of the merits of the scheme. Curzon further believed that Congress was manipulated from Calcutta by its best wire pullers and frothy orators, so any measure to dethrone Calcutta and encourage alternative centers of activity and influence would also weaken the Congress. He was convinced that the best guarantee of the political advantage of our proposal is its dislike by the Congress. the partition would also serve another purpose as the memorandum of lord minto 5th february 1906 who had succeeded curzon as the new viceroy and the resolution of october 1906 of sir lancelot hare the second lieutenant governor of east bengal and assam indicated this would destroy the virtual class rule by the bengali bhadralok or the landowning money lending professional and clerical classes belonging mostly to the three hindu upper castes of brahmin kayastha and badya they had monopolized education and employment to the virtual exclusion of all other communities and this was the main source of their political power so the antidote to bhadralok power was to encourage the development of other communities in this case it was the muslims who captured the attention of the colonial rulers A large concentration of Muslim population in the eastern districts of Bengal was first pointed out by Dr Francis Buchanan through his sociological and statistical surveys in the 19th century. In 1836 Adams report on vernacular education also pointed out a similar demographic phenomenon. The first census of 1872 revealed that 49.2% or nearly half of the population of Bengal were Muslims and they lived mainly in the eastern, central and northern districts. There was, in other words, a clear geographical divide along the river Bhagirathi, eastern Bengal being dominated by the Muslims, western Bengal by the Hindus and in central Bengal the two communities balanced each other. And not only that, This Muslim population was overwhelmingly rural in character and about 90% of them belonged to agricultural and low service groups. As early as 1896 it was being pointed out therefore that a new province in eastern Bengal would unite the significant Muslim population and would reduce the politically threatening position of the Hindu minority in undivided Bengal. Curzon in his Dhaka speech in February 1904 
define this policy in more categorical terms, in the new province of East Bengal the Muslims would enjoy a unity, which they never enjoyed since the days of the old Muslim rule. The final draft of the partition scheme, prepared in September 1904, also emphasized that in course of time Dhaka, the headquarters of the new province, would assume the character of a provincial capital where Muslim interests would be strongly represented if not become predominant. No wonder, the Muslims in eastern Bengal gradually rallied round the partition scheme. But the partition instead of dividing and weakening the Bengalis, further united them through an anti-partition agitation. Indeed, what the Kazonian administration had ignored was the emerging Bengali identity which cut across narrow interest groups, class, as well as regional barriers. Greater geographical mobility, evolution of a literary language in the 19th century and the modern communication agencies like the regional newspapers had already introduced a powerful narrative text for such horizontal solidarity. The economic condition of the province at the turn of the century also had created a charged situation. The famines and epidemics of the 1890s had shattered the faith in the providential British connections. The narrowing opportunities for the educated Bengalis, the rising prices fueled by consecutive bad harvests in the early 20th century made life miserable for the middle classes. At this juncture the partition instead of dividing the Bengali society, brought into existence a Swadeshi coalition by further consolidating the political alliance between the Calcutta leaders and their East Bengali followers, which according to Rajat Ray, was nothing less than a revolution in the political structure of Bengal society. The agitation against the partition had started in 1903, but became stronger and more organized after the scheme was finally announced and implemented in 1905. The initial aim was to secure the annulment of partition, but it soon enlarged into a more broad-based movement, known as the Swadeshi movement, touching upon wider political and social issues. Sumit Sarkar, 1973, has identified four major trends in Bengal Swadeshi, namely, the moderate trend, constructive Swadeshi, political extremism, and revolutionary terrorism. Periodization of these trends, he argues, is not possible as all the trends were present more or less simultaneously throughout the period. To summarize Sarkar's exposition here, the moderates began to criticize the partition scheme ever since it was announced in 1903. Assuming that the British would be amenable to arguments, through prayers, petitions and public meetings they sought to revise the scheme in its formative stage. But when they failed to do so and the partition was announced in 1905, they took the first initiative to transform the narrow agitation into a wider Swadeshi movement. For the first time they went beyond their conventional political methods and Surendranath Banerjee at a meeting in Calcutta on 17 July 1905 gave a call for the boycott of British goods and institutions. At another mass meeting at Calcutta Town Flail on 7 August a formal boycott resolution was passed, which marked the beginning of the Swadeshi movement. This was also the first time that the moderates tried to mobilize other than the literate section of the population, some of them participated in the national education movement, some of them even got involved in labor strikes. But their political philosophy remained the same, as they only sought to pressurize British Parliament to secure an annulment of partition and could not conceptualize boycott as a step towards the regeneration of national economy or start a full-scale passive resistance. As a reaction, a new trend developed with emphasis on self-reliance, village-level organization and constructive programs to develop indigenous or Swadeshi alternatives for foreign goods and institutions. By 1905, as Sarkar demonstrates, two main currents were visible in this extremist trend, a non-political constructive Swadeshi with strong emphasis on self-development endeavors and political extremism with its emphasis on passive resistance. The Bengal extremists were initially more inclined to constructive program which included amateurish attempts to manufacture daily necessities, national education, arbitration courts and village organization. 
It was from the 1890s that attempts were made to organize Swadeshi sales through exhibition and shops. The Bengal Chemical was started as a Swadeshi enterprise in 1893 and then another factory was started in 1901 to manufacture porcelain. National education movement started with Bhagbhat Chatuspati, 1895, of Satish Chandra Mukherjee, the Dawn Society, 1902-1907, the Saraswat Aitan of Brahm Bandhab Upadhyay, 1902, and the Santiniketan Ashram of Rabindranath Tagore, 1901. The emphasis was on non-political constructive programs or a self-strengthening movement before the political agitation, with importance attached to religious revivalism, as Hindu religion was expected to become the bond of unity for the whole nation. Rabindranath Tagore emerged as the main ideologue of this constructive Swadeshi, although revivalist ideas figured in his writings only between 1901 and 1906. In his Swadeshi Samaj address, delivered in 1904, he outlined the constructive program of self-help or Atmasakti, and after July 1905 this became the creed of the whole of Bengal, with Swadeshi enterprises like textile mills and handlooms, match and soap factories and tanneries coming up everywhere. National education movement moved forward with the establishment of national schools and the founding of the Bengal National College and School in August 1906. The Swadesh Bandhap Samiti in the district of Bakarganj claimed to have settled 523 disputes through its 89 arbitration committees by August 1906. But it was also around 1906 that this trend came to be criticized by the political extremists like Aurobindo Ghosh, Bipin Chandra Pal or Brahm Bandhab Upadhyay, who argued that without freedom no real regeneration of national life was possible. The movement hereafter began to take a new turn. Its goal no longer remained the mere abrogation of the partition, but complete independence or Swaraj, and in this sense the movement could not be considered in any way to be an expression of narrow Bengali subnationalism. The program at this stage included four things, boycott of British goods and institutions, development of their indigenous alternatives, violation of unjust laws and violent agitation if necessitated by British repression. As Sarkar argues, this anticipated the Gandhian program, minus of course his insistence on non-violence. This political program obviously required mass mobilization and religion was looked at by leaders like Aurobindo Ghosh as a means to reach the masses. Religious revivalism therefore was a main feature of this new politics. Bhagavad Gita became a source of spiritual inspiration for the Swadeshi volunteers and Hindu religious symbols, usually sakta imageries, were frequently used to mobilize the masses. But, as Barbara Southard, 1980, has shown, this also alienated the Muslims and failed to attract the lower caste peasants, many of whom were Vaishnavites. The other method of mass mobilization was to organize samitis. Prior to the banning of the five principal samitis in 1909 they were engaged in various forms of mobilizing efforts, such as moral and physical training, philanthropic work, propagation of the Swadeshi message, organization of the Swadeshi craft, education, arbitration courts, etc. But these mass mobilization efforts ultimately failed as the membership of the Samitis did not extend much beyond the ranks of educated Bhadralok and this high-caste Hindu gentry leadership alienated the lower-caste peasantry by often using their coercive power. And not just physical coercion that was used, the Swadeshi leaders rampantly deployed the tool of social coercion or social boycott, exerted through caste associations, professional bodies, and nationalist organizations, to punish collaborators or to produce consent among the reluctant participants. The latter's reluctance was often because of the divergence of interests with those of the leaders who claimed to represent them. Swadeshi alternatives were often more expensive than British goods, national schools were not adequate in number. Moreover, some of the lower caste peasants, like the Rajbanses in North Bengal or the Namsudras in the East, had developed around this time aspirations for social mobility and self-respect, which the Swadeshi movement, 
devoid of any social program, fail to accommodate or even recognize. The other method of mass mobilization of the Swadeshis was to organize labor strikes, primarily in the foreign-owned companies. But here too the nationalists could penetrate only into the ranks of white-collar workers, while the vast body of Hindustani labor force as well as the plantation labor remained untouched by such nationalist efforts. It was primarily because of this failure of mass mobilization that the Bokot movement failed to affect British imports into India. By 1908 political extremism had definitely declined, giving way to militant nationalism. But certainly another contributory factor behind this decline was the Surat split of 1907. The All India political alignments in 1906 to 1907 could be best described as in a state of confusion. The Bengal moderates cherished their connection with the Bombay group, but local politics imposed upon them a more radical course as they wholeheartedly denounced the partition and supported Bokot, Swadeshi, and national education. These radical tendencies, the Bombay leaders, like Feroj Shah Mehta, Dinshaw Vacha, or Gokhale, could not appreciate at all. On the other hand, among the non-Bengali extremists, Lala Lajpat Rai was clearly in favour of restraint and wanted reconciliation between the moderates and the extremists. Even Tilak was not all for a showdown, it was only Ajit Singh in Punjab who was staunchly against any compromise. However, the real issue in All India politics in 1906 to 1907 was how far the radicalism generated by the Swadeshi movement in Bengal was to be incorporated into the future politics of the Congress on an All India theatre. Already by the end of 1905, political unrest had been reported from 23 districts of the United Provinces, 20 in Punjab, 13 in Madras Presidency. 24 towns in Bombay Presidency and 15 in the central provinces. Widespread agrarian riots were reported from Rawalpindi and Lahore. In Pune, plague and the interventionist prophylactic official measures had aroused political emotions that tended to radicalize public life, although still at an elite level, and sharpen the discord between Gokhale and Tilak. The Bengal extremists got in touch with the Tilak group in Maharashtra and sought to give the Congress program a new orientation at the Calcutta Congress of 1906. And here, in spite of the opposition of Gokhale and the machinations of Mehta, they scored a resounding victory with the help of the Bengal moderates. Four resolutions were passed in favour of Bokot, Swadeshi, National Education and Swaraj, and partition was condemned. It was here that the extremist party was born with Tilak as the leader and their main goal was to keep intact the four Calcutta resolutions, which the Bombay moderates were determined to revise at the next session of the Congress. The 1907 session of the Congress was scheduled to take place at Pune, which was an extremist stronghold. The moderates, therefore, shifted the venue to Surat. Lala Lajpat Rai, who had been deported, had by then returned from Mandalay and the extremists proposed his name as the next Congress president, while the moderate candidate was Rash Bihari Ghosh. But Rai, who did not want a split, refused to accept the nomination and so the ultimate fight between the two contending groups boiled down to the question of either retention or rejection of the four Calcutta resolutions. Feroj Shah Mehta conspired to keep the resolutions out of the Congress agenda, while the extremists decided to oppose the nomination of Rash Bihari Ghosh if the resolutions were not retained. The Bengal Congress was already divided, as on the occasion of the Midnapur District Conference, Surendranath Banerjee and Aurobindo Ghosh had parallel sessions. Yet, Banerjee took the initiative to preserve Congress unity and tried to have a reconciliation, without any success, between Gokhale and Tilak. The open session of the Congress at Surat ended in a pandemonium over the election of Rash Bihari Ghosh, with shoes flying, chairs toppled, and men running for cover. But even after this incident Tilak was willing to reunite the Congress, but Mehta seemed intransigent, as he sought to reconstitute the party by purging the extremist elements, a task which he accomplished at the following Allahabad Convention. The Congress of 1908 
known as the Mehta Congress, was attended only by the moderates, who reiterated their loyalty to the Raj. The Bengal model of politics was finally rejected. Congress was certainly weakened at this stage and became an ineffective body. The extremist politics, on the other hand, could not crystallize either into a new political organization, as Tilak died soon after and Aurobindo Ghosh became more spiritually oriented. The two factions could again come together and the Congress revitalized when Gandhi took the leadership in 1920. So far as Bengal was concerned, by 1908 political Swadeshi was certainly on the decline and was taken over by another trend, individual attacks against British officials and Indian collaborators. This signified, as Sarkar, 1973, points out, a shift from non-violence to violence and also from mass action to elite action, necessitated primarily by the failure of the mass mobilization efforts. The culture of violence as a mode of political protest was always alive in India even after the suppression of the revolt of 1857. In Maharashtra in 1876-1877, Vasudev Balwant Farke had gathered around him a band of Ramoshis and other backward classes and engaged them in Dakotis to collect money for his more grandiose scheme of an armed revolt against the English. He was caught in 1879 and was deported to Aden where he later died a lonely death. But the revolutionary trend was kept alive in Maharashtra through the physical culture movement and formation of youth clubs, the most well known of which was founded in Pune by the Chapekar brothers, Damodar and Balkrishna. But from here they moved further and in 1897 killed W.C. Rand, the notorious chairman of the Pune Plague Commission which was allegedly responsible for the atrocities perpetrated by the soldiers during their house searches to identify plague victims. Both of them were later caught and hanged, but the tradition lingered on. In Bengal, militant nationalism developed in the same way since the 1860 and 1870, when the physical culture movement became a craze and akras or gymnasiums were set up everywhere to develop what Swami Vivekananda had described as strong muscles and nerves of steel. As mentioned earlier, this was a psychological attempt to break away from the colonial stereotype of effeminacy imposed on the Bengalis. Their symbolic recovery of masculinity and search for virai heroes remained parts of a larger moral and spiritual training to achieve mastery over body, develop a national pride and a sense of social service on the basis of ideals preached by Bankim and Vivekananda. The real story of militant nationalism in Bengal begins from 1902 with the formation of four groups, three in Calcutta and one in Midnapur. The first was the Midnapur Society founded in 1902 and this was followed by the founding of a gymnasium by Sarla Ghosal in Baligan Circular Road in Calcutta, the Atmonoti Samiti by some central Calcutta youths and the Anushilan Samiti by Satish Chandra Basu in March 1902. The progress of this movement till 1905 was modest, but the beginning of the Swadeshi movement in that year brought an upsurge in secret society activities. The Dhaka Anushilan Samiti was born in October 1906 through the initiative of Pulin Bihari Das. This was followed by an All Bengal Conference of the Revolutionaries in December, and a revolutionary weekly called Yuganta started in the same year. A distinct group within the Calcutta Anushilan Samiti, headed by Barindra Kumar Ghosh, Aurobindo's brother, Hemchandra Kanungo, and Prafullo Chaki, soon started action. The first Sadeshi Dakoti or robbery to raise funds was organized in Rangpur in August 1906 and a bomb manufacturing unit was set up at Manikla in Calcutta. Attempts to assassinate oppressive officials and spies, robbery in the houses of wealthy Saha merchants who had earlier refused to stop dealing in foreign goods became the main features of the revolutionary activities since 1907-1908. But the abortive attempt at Muzaffarpur on the life of the presidency magistrate Kings Ford on 30 April 1908 by Khudiram Bose and Prafullo Chaki and the following arrest of the entire Manikla group, including Aurobindo and Barindra Kumar Ghosh, dealt a great blow to such militant activities. In terms of direct gains, 
the revolutionaries achieved precious little, most of their attempts were either aborted or failed. Nor did they believe that assassinations or dacotis would alone bring in India's liberation, as Aurobindo's original idea was to prepare for an open-armed revolution. But they also achieved a lot. The hanging of Khudiram and the Manikla bomb conspiracy trial, publicized by the press and immortalized in folk songs, fired the imagination of the entire Bengali population. C.R. Das, still a briefless barrister, appeared as a defense counsel for Aurobindo and argued that if preaching the principle of freedom was any crime, then the accused was surely guilty. To everybody's surprise, Aurobindo was acquitted, but Balindra and Ulaskar Datta were sentenced to death and ten others were to be deported for life. On appeal, the death sentences were reduced to life imprisonment, and some other sentences were reduced as well. The movement hereafter went underground and became decentralized, but did not die down. Revolutionary activities by now had acquired legitimacy in popular mind, as many people believed that it was an effective alternative to the earlier mendicant policies of the moderates. When the Molimento reforms were announced in 1909, many of these people believed it was because of fear generated by revolutionary activities. As one historian argues, the appointment of Lord S.P. Sinha as the law member in the Viceroy's Executive Council was surely the result of pressures generated by violent activities. The partition of Bengal itself was annulled in 1911 and although the measure was presented as a coronation boon from George V, it might not have been totally unrelated to such pressures. But there were other administrative calculations too the most important of which was the transfer of capital from Calcutta to Delhi, a measure that certainly needed to be sugar-coated. This marked the end of Bengali dominance in national politics of India. The Curzonian aim of weakening the Bengali politicians was achieved in a different way and now with less resistance. But the annulment of partition did not bring an end to militant nationalism, as violence was not generated by partition alone. The centre of activities now moved to Punjab and Uttar Pradesh, where the Bengali revolutionaries were joined by the Punjabis returning from North America, where they had formed the revolutionary Ghan Party. They organised the Cortis throughout North India to raise funds and in 1912 plotted an unsuccessful attempt to assassinate the Viceroy Lord Hardinge. In September 1914 the stranded Punjabi gadrites on board the Kamakta MAM clashed with the army at Baj Baj near Calcutta. With the outbreak of World War I, even more grandiose schemes of organizing armed revolts in the Indian army with help from Germany or Japan began to appear. Rash Bihari Bose operating from Lahore tried to organize an army revolt throughout North India, but failed to evoke any response from the sepoys and ultimately fled to Japan. In Bengal, the revolutionaries united under the leadership of Jatin Mukherjee tried to smuggle in arms from Germany, but the amateurish attempt ultimately ended in an uneven battle with the British police at Balasor in Orissa. The unbound repression of the government at this period, freely using the new Wartime Defence of India Act, 1915, made violent attacks more and more infrequent. But the spectre of revolutionary violence did not disappear at all and it made the Sedition Committee to draft in 1918 the draconian Rolat Bills, which inflamed Mahatma Gandhi into action and to initiate a new phase in Indian politics, where the central focus would shift from violence to non-violence, from elite action to mass agitation. If you like this video so please do like, share this video and hit the subscribe button.